Welcome to the Only One Mike Podcast, Paul Gerard, Brooklyn Dre, J. Rob is in the building. We are having today a very, very, very special guest, Miss Patricia Smith-Griffith. Miss Griffith is the head of the Legacy of Charities Children. There's so many things that we want to talk to you about. Miss Griffith, go ahead and jump on in here. How are you? Oh, thank you. Thank you all for having me today. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. Well, yes, yes. yes thank Welcome. You. Good to have you. So um, there's so many things that we can cover with you. Such that chat, you know, charity children is one thing, mm -hmm. but just in the research of you as an individual, mm -hmm. you are just doing so hey. much different things. <laughs> amazing, amazing. <laughs> a historian, a uh, genealogist, you know, broadcasting. You had a career in broadcasting. Yeah. So what, yeah. What, what, what did you have like a show or, you know, what did you do? My, um, my career in broadcasting, I will tell you that. Yeah. My first job was in radio. My first job was when I was 16 years old. Um, the Dayton Public School System had a magnet school program for mass media. And my mother insisted that I go. Oh. And um, how she knew, well, I'm a parent, so I know how she knew. Uh, but she knew that this was a talent. This was, a, a and more than that for me, uh, radio uh, broadcasting is in my blood. I absolutely uh, love radio. And so wow. my first job was at um, WDPS in Dayton, Ohio, as a student broadcaster. And I think it was okay. by that summer. I uh, worked there during the summer as well as the program director and um, on-air talent. And um, Ohio University is where I went to um the School of Broadcasting there. Um, I do boast that um, that is the best school of broadcasting in the country. There. Oh, okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So after um, graduation, I did some freelance writing. And um, before long, I was working at WROU Radio. Uh, Ronita Hall Saunders is a Black woman who... And I did a public affairs show for the country station. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what was that like? how, how did that work out for you? <laughs> well, you should know that it worked out very well. Oh, okay. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it worked out very well. And surprising to learn just how far reaching the region of Appalachia is. And so many of us, are Appalachian and don't even know it. Uh, uh, so it was, yeah, it was a, it was a pretty cool experience there as well. So I, you got uh, some Garth Brooks CDs? Or... <laughs> here's, here's the thing about that. Here's the interesting thing. So uh, while I was working there, my youngest daughter, I don't know how, it wasn't like I was listening to country music around the house, but she fell in love with country music. Mm. And wow. so this kid has always been a prankster, even as a teeny tiny one. So she told me one day, she said, Mommy, my favorite song is Prop Me Up Beside the Jukebox When I oh, Die. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know that one too? <laughs> I thought it was a joke. I thought it was a joke. And yeah. so I was teasing with some of the owner of talent at the country <clears throat> station. And I told them that my daughter is always fooling around with me. And she said that this was her favorite song. And she was like, you do know that's an actual song. And they made this uh, tape for this child to uh, go to sleep by country music. Uh, and so, yeah, so that was, a, it was an enlightening experience for all concerned, for all oh, concerned. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, while I was at Cox, I went to uh, Russia. This was not long after the fall of communism. Mm. And um, I went to a place called Nizhny Norgrov. Nizhny Norgrov used to be uh, Gorky. And so people who are kind of familiar with world history knows know that Gorky was a military city, which yeah. was a closed city. And that meant that during communism, no one came or went out of that city. And wow. so you lived there for generations with just 
the same people. So a black woman coming to Nishni Norgrab mm-hmm. right, right, right. was big news, was okay. big news. Yeah, that's and, what I wanted to know. Like, how did that feel? Like, you know, I'm pretty sure it was like seeing a unicorn out there in Russia, you know. It was exactly that. And <laughs> um, it was a little bit intimidating at first because this was part of a program called the Friendship Force. Mm-hmm. And the Friendship Force was founded by uh, Jimmy and Rosalind Carter. Um, it began as a cultural exchange, but after the fall of communism, the radio band in Russia opened up because it used to just be one broadcast station, Radio Russia broadcast to everything and everybody. So after the fall of communism, the uh, radio band opened up. And so they began this business and culture and cultural exchange. It became a business exchange as well. And they sent radio veterans to um, Russia and various regions there um, to, I guess we were ambassadors and uh, even tutoring some of the stations in how we operate radio stations in, in the U S. So there were other stations that went with us, but, um, and they sent two people, they would send people in pairs, but Cox sent me by myself. So I didn't, I didn't have, a pair <laughs> right, right, right. to, uh, you know, buddy up with. But um, I will say that to say that I was uh, treated well would be an understatement. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. yeah. To say that I was treated well, I would be an understatement. Uh, one of the most innocent things that happened, um, part of my stay there was we exchanged letters from my children's school with an English speaking school there in uh, Russia. And when I went to speak to the children and tour the school, they didn't know much about America uh, other than Looney Tunes. And they knew (laughs) even less about Black people. And I will always remember the innocence of this child walking past me and touching my hand Mm. and then looking at hers. Oh, Mm. wow. So now, mind you, this had been a closed city. So this was just a few years after this city had opened to the outside world. And the innocence of that child touching my hand, because y'all know how pretty our chocolate looks like. <laughs> right, 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 right. Rub it off, you know. <laughs> this but is one, the, wonderful honey skin, man. It's wonderful. <laughs> right, right. And so she just she wanted to see, right. but I um that I found that to be just it, the epitome of of innocence. Right. And um, I was blessed with a wonderful inter- interpreter. Uh, Natasha was by my side. After I left Moscow, uh, she was by my side while I was in Nizhny Novgorod. But uh, I will say that um, Moscow was a little bit intimidating. Mm. They, they seize your passports uh, upon your arrival. Um, the war in Chechnya had broken out while we were in the air. We didn't even know about it until um, after we landed. So, uh, yeah, so, but good experiences, good experiences and um, ended my career, not ended, but yeah, not the ended. last, one of the last things that I did was radio news and uh, being a news junkie. That was, um, that was great. I love it. Did you miss it at all? Um, what if I were not doing the podcast? Oh, okay. yeah. Okay, okay. Because one of the things that I said in um, our, our first episode, Wildest Dreams, I talk about how uh, radio is like a nagging love that won't leave you alone. Yeah, um, right. And uh, had I not found another outlet for it, I would guarantee you that it would bother me. And very, I, I will say this because, and it's quite personal, but in very recent years, I had to explain to my family when we would go on long trips why I would not be so interested in listening to the radio. Because if I wasn't on the air and if I was not about to be on the air, it was difficult to take. I was going to ask, and like, I know, especially during your time, I mean, uh, broadcasting was like a male dominated business. You know what I mean? So, and I know it was tough for Caucasian women. So it had to be extremely tough for you. Are you able to speak on that or um, have you experienced any issues all coming of up through the business? You can think of, all okay. of them that you can think of. And um, 
I, I struggle to describe them and talk about them in um, today's climate and culture because I'm not sure how it will be received and interpreted. So, uh, yes, um, any of the sexual harassment things that you can think of that could happen okay. have happened. Oh, that oh, happened. Wow. Um, mm. There are ways that as I began to grow and mature, there were ways that I learned to deal with it and um, and seize my power. And so the young Miss Patricia was putting hands on people at, back in times. Um, <laughs> or or <laughs> there is there's, there's a temper issue. Sure. I got you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that I, and I will also say that it helped me that I have um, I had an adoring father okay. and I am the youngest of nine. OK. And of those nine, five are brothers. Mm. OK. Mm -hmm. So when a man attempts to say something destabilizing and shocking to me, well, it's a problem. Yeah. Uh, well, you see, I have uh, a comeback. Yeah, she fired right I now. have um, a support system that gives me the space and the strength to have a comeback. It was in, and, and I, it was something that recently um, came up. I was talking about an incident at one of the um, stations I worked at, and how it was very clear to me that the gentleman was attempting to be provocative to um, what I interpreted as seize my power, um, intimidate me by saying something shocking. And um, so being a woman, we have to be very selective and calculating in how we respond. Right. Um, I began to pack my brief briefcase and I walked towards the door. And when I had one foot out of the door, I turned to him and gave him what he thought that he would not receive from me. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> just, and I proceeded just that to look, that look alone. It is, it is yeah, what it, it is. is. <laughs> <laughs> and and I proceeded to leave. Um, when I got back to work a couple of days, you know, weekend, I got back to work a couple of days later, and I'm meeting with my program director, and he says, um, I heard about what happened. Now, mind you, I really do not recall telling anybody so this gentleman must have felt so mm. um, a, a, attacked. He must have felt so uh, intimidated that he reported me. Oh, yeah. Okay? Wow. <laughs> he reported the comeback that I gave him. Okay. He reported me. Uh. Um, and much to his surprise, you know, the company is like, uh, no, she could actually sue us for that. Right. And um, so my program director asked me, was that, did, did I, do you want to sue? Do you want to write a formal complaint? Um, and I said to him, I have five brothers. Mm -hmm. Ain't much, yeah. ain't much that you can ain't say to me say. that I haven't heard yeah. or don't know how to deal with. <laughs> Huh. And, uh, you know, let's go on with this meeting so that we can, you know, talk about this week's show. Yeah. Uh, that was it. And that was all. Now, do I encourage young women to do that? I don't know. It's on a case by case basis. <laughs> you have to, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> you have to know your environment. You have to, um, I don't know, maybe there would be, maybe I should have sued. Um, right, right. But it was apparently enough of a story, y'all, that years down the road, one of the new program directors, when I saw her at some social event, brought it up to me oh, yeah. wow. Wow. and wow. said, you know, we do, we should thank you mm. for not suing. And, <laughs> and I think that that was probably the first time I was like, wow, you know, that <laughs> did have all the making. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but, um, being so singularly minded, uh, my focus was on doing my um, was on doing my show. Mm -hmm. And you have so few opportunities that you've got to make. And this is an awful position to put any professional in, but you have so few opportunities that you have to weigh the consequences of me focusing on this distraction rather than moving forward. Um, there was a gentleman who I, I had a show at one time and he constantly badgered my producer and I uh, before we would come on the air. Mm -hmm. And I told her, you know, he gets three, four, five times the amount of time on the air that we do. Right. If we come back and address all of his BS, then when do we get to do our show? Mm -hmm. Then he's won. Then when when do we get to do our show? However, I did get my say. 
I did get my say. And um and I'm thinking about it today because I just found the tape. I know? just found the tape from that show where I did my drop the mic. So oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and I and I wish we knew that earlier because we could have kind of inserted it in this conversation right here. <laughs> <laughs> you throw that up on YouTube yeah. or something like that, you know? And just title it Message okay. to the Up and Coming. Yeah. you know, radio host out there. But <laughs> how do you feel now that you see like a lot of the strides being made with, you know, female radio hosts? I absolutely love it. Yeah. I absolutely love it. And I applaud um, these young women. I, um, once again, I want to uh, remind them to uh, know your worth and yeah. seize your power. As women, we have to be careful that we don't become manipulated by this male dominated industry. Because when we allow these men to define who we are, and how we are going to communicate with each other, we are truly losing ourselves and forgetting the privilege that we have as uh, broadcasters and whether or not we want to be as examples for young black women. Mm -hmm. So I want us to take our responsibility seriously and be sure that we are not being manipulated by uh, mainstream media, um, by corporate America to become this image that they have of our black femaleness mm, right. rather than to um claim who we are mm. claim our strength and for goodness sake maybe please claim our dignity right, right. um yes. because the black women that i write about have to be some of the most dignified people that i have ever uh, encountered dignified within undignified spaces and circumstances so it is on their shoulders that we stand. It is through their accomplishments that we strive and we just have a responsibility to um, each other as right, black yeah. women to um, to love each other in the way that we that we know we uh, can and should. Right. And uh, because we've got these platforms, we can do it our way. Yep. It doesn't have to be. Uh, their way. We can do it our way. We should not allow ourselves mm. to be pitted against each other. Okay. We should find ways to encourage each other, uplift each other. And because ble being black and female in America is too difficult in and of itself. Mm. And when I see my sister across the way, I want to know that that is the warm hand that's going to be reaching towards me. I, I don't, I don't want to think or pause to believe that she would she would slap my hand away but so often that's the representation that we see on television within reality tv that's a beautiful utopia that you're painting you know <laughs> right. unfortunately you know but that yeah. is not what that is not where we are yeah, right, 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 right. sisters don't trust each other and uh we i i keep going back to us allowing ourselves to be pitted against each other and there are a myriad of generational things that have happened to lead us to where we are right now. Uh, things that go back to the Johnson administration and right. when black men were put out of homes in order for black women to receive right. subsidies for their children, something right. that it still exists to this day. To this day. Um, the war on drugs, the war on crime, the mass incarceration that mm -hmm. took black men out of our homes right. and um, made the few that remained be coveted and, mm -hmm. and um, something that we felt that we had to fight each other for it is um it's distressing when as i do my historical research that you can almost see these inevitable patterns um emerging the law of relativity comes into play because of this action there's going to be this reaction. And um, I think that we um, can do better than that. I think that we can form uh, coalitions where we elevate uh, Black love and celebrate our Blackness. One of the things that um, prior to my research, when, when, I, when I did have free time, I used to enjoy reading slave narratives. And there was a particular narrative that I was reading that talked about um, the just the basic tenant of it was the lengths that a black man went 
to love a black woman. Black women were not just a commodity, but they were the possessions of the masters, the master's sons, the master's brothers, uncles, who would overseers, who would ever right. require them. So if a black man were attracted or fell in love with a woman that was coveted by the master. It's dangerous. Yeah. It was an awfully dangerous situation right. to be in. And to read these slave narratives of where black men would go for years, traveling back and forth between plantations to see the woman that they loved, where they formed these traditions of jumping the broom because they wanted to legitimize their love. Um, I think we've gone a far place from that, you know, right. Um, right. even even as far as uh, Gamble and Huff. You know, if you don't love know me by now, you'll never know me. Right. Don't get excited, Jay. John, I, don't get excited. That's, that's where you're from, Philly, man. Oh, please. And don't, let's don't even talk about Teddy. Oh, uh -oh. Right. Hey. Okay. Turn I'm out the about. lights. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So, I want Bring to back be, love. Bring I back the love. I want our new black songwriters to serenade me like that. Uh -huh. right, right. Speaking of that country music, I heard a song by Brad Paisley one day. And I thought, oh my goodness! They got, some, they got they got some good stuff, man. Yes, they got some good stuff, man. Oh Unfort unfortunately, I found out by being a uh, on, on a truck. A well, I was, no, I was on the room. I was a roommate of a guy in the military, man. And he woke up listening to country music every morning. I couldn't take it for a long time, but there was a few that I actually I dug. It's a few. <laughs> it's a few. Found out of my, I got my <laughs> introduction out there on the road on that truck. Yeah. <laughs> Searching for radio stations. Mm -hmm. I bet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I I think that we've uh, we've come a long way far uh, from where we um, know that we should be. I'm waiting for you young people to bring us full circle uh, back to where we should be, which is part of my um, work with history. And I'm, I'm glad you brought I that up, Miss Patricia, because that's what we try to do here. Yeah, you know what I mean, trying to you know we have people like you on the show, so that you know we can educate those that's listening. You know, to this show, it's easy just for us to get on ahead and do some foolishness, but that's not us. You know, and just class and just classy, like you know, yeah. me and uh, the brothers here were talking one time last week, and we were just like, like, what happened to our aunts, man? You know, mm -hmm. like just classy right. women. Like I'm looking at you right now, just a classy presentation. Just you know, you're relaxed right. and everything like that. You know, and we like you were just talking about some of these uh, new broadcasters and stuff like that. It's nothing like that. The word lady is like yeah. you know, I don't use the word lady. I don't just give it out to anybody, but mm -hmm. you know. Right. You know, when you see a lady, it's just undeniable, you know what I mean? Right. So, right. you know, we were just talking about this recently. So we, we want to talk about your story because we can go into this. So this is one of these conversations <laughs> that we love to have. Yeah. Me too. We Me too. Yeah, but but quick, quickly, um, before we go on, I know the listeners can't see the pictures um, that are behind you, but yeah. are they family members? They absolutely are. Um, uh, Charity Brody is who I'm pointing to there. that picture, yeah. yeah. Yeah, 1802. Uh, her mm -hmm. father brought her from Louisville, Kentucky to Dayton, Ohio. Uh, next to Charity is her great-granddaughter, Julia Galloway Higgins, who uh, is oh, an Ohio suffragist. We recently honored her with a um, historic marker yeah. uh, to commemorate her suffragist work. She has been added to the Queens of the Heartland exhibit at the uh, National Afro-American Museum and Cultural Center mm. in Wilberforce, Ohio. Um, this poster here is of Julia as a, as a suffragist. And then the two women on the, I don't think you can see the picture by the light, but those are the keepers of the family treasures. Those, okay. uh, that is my mother, Emma Johnson Smith, and um, her first cousin, uh, Betty Jane Duggar Ferguson. So I um, surround myself with these women. Um, I need to be inspired as I tell uh, the story. As I do the research, it's been, I'm going to really sit down at some point and count the number of years that I probably um, put into just researching um, the story. It is the journalist in me who wanted to confirm these oral and written histories with actual facts. And it has been truly the thrill of my lifetime to be able to do that 
um, the stories that have been told to us for so many generations, because they were consistently told over the generations the same way, I have been able to go back and look in county records, uh, census reports, uh, city directories, birth and death certificates, and confirm these oral histories. I've been able to utilize literally American history to uh, document some of the um, archival letters that we have. Uh, letters from Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, Mary Church Terrell, Langston Hughes. Um, so it's been a process of research, then not just the research, but I'm kind of a stickler. So I often end up researching the research, which means I'm researching right. footnotes because I want it to be my primary sourcing. And um, so it's taken some time. Mm -hmm. But we have been able to weave our story with um, newspaper accounts. So that's okay. why we have been able to bring the legacy of Charity's children almost to uh, to life in telling our story in such a linear fashion. So your great grandmother, Charity Dav Davis Caesar Brody, was an abolitionist and underground railroad conductor. Yes. Right? So can you tell us? I'm her fourth great granddaughter. Fourth, fourth great granddaughter. Wow. Fourth great granddaughter. Okay. Yeah. So I know you have like a plethora of stories. Can you educate <laughs> the listeners on, you know, your your grandmother's, you know, abolition work and and underground railroad conduction work? Because these are things that that's not put in the history books. You know, absolutely not. When yeah. one tells and 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 even in researching uh, Dayton's history. The fact that there were literally pioneers. Ohio was founded in 1802. The, it was made a state in 1803. And that was the year that Charity's father, John Isaac Davis, brought her from the Louisville, Kentucky area. So literally, our family has been there uh, for 220 years mm -hmm. since uh, since it became a state. Lived there in the Miami Valley. And I always begin to stutter when people ask me about charity. It's because she did so many things and her lifespan was 98 years. She lived mm -hmm. to be 98 years old. Mm -hmm. Part of my research has been and, and the, the verification process is because I, now I've always known this family story. Our family, um, I, and I'm often asked, when did I learn about Charity Brody? And I will tell you, when did I learn my name? It's not something that I learned. It is something that I've always known was this family story. And I've always been the skeptic. Well, you know, Ma, you talk about her being a suffragist. She was at the uh, Ain't I a Woman speech with Sojourner Truth in Akron, right. Ohio. Um, you talk about her, you know, being a conductor on the Underground Railroad and, um, you know, how th these these timelines are not, you know, crossing for me. So that was part of the inspiration of my research. And I soon came to understand that when one lives 98 years, you a lot, you've seen a lot, seen a lot, and done a lot. a lot of seasons. Right. Um, and we've, we've got so many family stories about her uh, season. I think it's episode three mm -hmm. is the fire watchers. Right. It talks about charity um, mounting her horse and patrolling Dayton streets. What folks need to understand about the free Northwest territory is that it was not free. And that many people who came and settled in the free Northwest Territory bought their enslaved human beings mm. with them to that territory and then fought to keep them wow. against Ohio law and constitution. They still fought to keep them. Right. Treacherous times. During that time, um, mobs attacked black homes throughout Ohio in the 1830s. There were over 18 pro-slavery mob attacks throughout Ohio, um, the worst of which happened there in Dayton's Africatown. Uh, I, Charity Brody, as a fire watcher, they patrolled the night streets because, and this is a quote from her, uh, lest some of the belligerent whites of the mob set fire to our homes and burn us alive. Wow. In writing that particular story, it was... It was a curious day for me. And I recently thought back and realized 
that the fire watcher story and the story of the attack on Dayton's Africa town. I wrote both of those stories during the George Floyd uh, riots. Wow. <laughs> Didn't write about George Floyd riots, mm -hmm. but I wrote about this, the fire watchers. You see, we have always done the least desirable jobs. And in Dayton, Ohio, the black settlement was called Africa Town. It was in an area called Seeley's Ditch, where the runoff from the factories and the sewage gathered. Black men emancipated families and those who were fleeing in slavery being enslaved, came to Dayton, Ohio to help build canals that connected Dayton to Cincinnati and on up through Canada. The community began to thrive. And so these same Black men that were rehabilitating and these canals and building these canals, well, what do you think they did in Seeley's Ditch? They transformed okay. Seeley's okay. Ditch. Yep. <laughs> it, it became a thriving Black community taverns, bathhouse, manicures, homes, businesses, and it catered not just to Dayton's few Black residents, but see, this was the free Northwest Territory. So all travelers that came through the free Northwest Territory would stop in Dayton's Africa town. Wow. So what happens? Those land speculators are like, nah, this ain't going down like this. And one thing led to another. A black woman of light complexion came to town and rumor had it that she was a white woman. Uh, and that was one of the pretenses of the attack on Africa town. They burned Africa town to the ground. Um, Charity Brody and. Isn't that always the way though? Isn't that crazy? That's, that's the whole yeah, thing with black wall street. That's how black wall street. Uh, and several, yeah. several other towns that was just like. Yeah, wow. yeah. It's like almost a script. Yeah, almost a script. It, <laughs> is, it is exactly the script. And. Here's the thing that I want you to understand about Dayton's Africa Town, because yeah. when you talk about Black Wall Street, when you talk about um, uh, Greenwood, these were places in the 1900s. This was during and post Reconstruction. Within the antebellum period, before the Dred Scott decision in Dayton, Ohio, free Blacks had a thriving community with homes and businesses. And regardless of how long Africa Town existed, the fact that it existed at all should be a source of pride for Dayton, for Ohio, and for our country. That despite the the finger of oppression and and um, violence, that that community strived and it thrived until February 1841, and Africa Town was looted and burned to the ground. There were many black families who left, but Charity Brody, Charity Brody stayed. And she and a group of women called the United Daughters of Zion founded the first Wesleyan Methodist Church. 181 years later, First Wesleyan still exists in Dayton, Ohio, and continues to serve the community. I don't know if you noticed us, but we're all sitting here writing in writing pens yeah, and, and writing it, down everything you're and saying. And if the listener doesn't know. So we can know. Get it. It's like we're sitting here listening to a griot. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. exactly. If the listener yeah, don't know, we all take we take all in learning mode. Yeah, we we right. can get back to the stories yeah. later. This ain't even about mode. what we're talking yeah, about. Not, I'm <laughs> about to Google everything you're talking about. <laughs> but this is what it's about, though. This is what it's about. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I encourage you to um, listen to um, the legacy of charity's children, because one of the things that I do is I share my methods of research and I share information that I think will help other families do the same thing. We all have a story to tell. We all come from greatness and, and from one generation to the next, what there are some generations for whom it is just necessary to get us to the next. The times are hard. The circumstances are impossible. And what we have to do is to begin to find the greatness in, in survival. Any other group of people would be professionally and clinically diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. When you think about the repetitive nature of and the insidious nature of racism, when you think about the unpredictability of it, where we can start out on our mornings just happy, fine, and dandy. And before you know it, you are slapped in the face with your blackness and your second-class citizenship. Oh, yeah. 
that becomes stunning. And to other groups of people, the label of traumatic is assigned to that. Triggering is assigned to that. But we as Black people don't recognize our what has become psychologically debilitating for us to exist in America. What I, I, I worry about often is that, and, and, I, and I have stopped saying it myself, um, referring to our 400 plus years of struggle, because I don't want I don't want y'all to feel no ways tired. Mm. Uh, the torches have to be passed. And um, no, the story wasn't told completely in their generation. Right. But they survived and they preserved it. And now here I am. You know, it's funny that you should bring up PTSD because when I was in the military and, you know, I was getting evaluated for it, like after I left the military. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, most of the stuff that they had, mm -hmm. you know, brought up as a qualification of PTSD, I already had it. <laughs> way before I joined the military, you know what I mean? So it's amazing that you, you know, brought that up and said that, you know, I think we all should get a check from the government. <laughs> and I think that, absolutely. And we should also, as black people, change our perspective about our mental health. Mm -hmm. If I break my arm, then I need it to be put in a sling. If my heart and my head is right. not in, right. in line, aligning, then I need help for that too. Right. And um, no one should expect the undiagnosed, unaddressed trauma that we have consistently experienced. No one should expect that to be something that we should easily function with. We absolutely should not. When any and every Black mother gives their children, their son and their daughters, the talk. That's trauma. Yeah. That's trauma. I was I was sharing with a doctor, and this was during the George Floyd riots, that my son had come home from uh, Indiana, and he was leaving. And I took a picture as he was standing at the back of his car with his racially ambiguous girlfriend. I took a picture, <laughs> and... I was explaining to the doctor that now to you, this just looks like a mother saying goodbye to her son. I said, but do you know what this is? I said, every mother since Emmett Till will take a picture of her child before they depart right. mm. to document his condition at the last kiss goodbye. That is trauma. Absolutely. Right. That is Absolutely. trauma. And any other group of people would, it would be understood and help would be on the way. But we are allowed to be self-destructive as we attempt to deal with what is unaddressed. And unacknowledged, especially since we are constantly reminded of it, especially in media, you know, we're probably the only group of people in human history who have all of our trauma constantly documented and repeated, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, like when, when the thing happened <laughs> with George Floyd, it almost was like CNN put that on a loop, you know, the riots happened. It was on a loop, you know, any, any, even, even those you know, cops that, that beat the young brother to death, even though it was black police officers that did it, it's still a constant reminder of, oh, all of this, Trayvon. Trayvon, even yes. when we see our young brothers and sisters out here beating up an elder or, or robbing somebody, it's flashed on the news on a constant loop. And that is just in itself traumatic or just to give anybody who is not of our nationality a negative view of us. I often wonder if, uh, if those things are put in place to keep us in place. Just like lynching. You know, just like, you know, lynching back in the days, you know, lynch the strongest man in front of a bunch of slaves and then everybody will fall in place. And, you know, and, so leave, them, and leave them up there so everybody can see them. Yeah. So I often wonder if those things are put on TV to say, stay where you're at. I, um, I have always wondered <laughs> about that, too. Um, a couple things here. One of the things that I attempt to do in telling these stories because there's a line that you have to walk in order to, we need to reveal the atrocities, but we must stop exploiting black trauma. It's amazing that you said that because I, we, we, we've talked about this on this show. And um, I often wonder like, you know, the many states that I've been through in the South and they got these slave blocks and stuff like that up. And I, I think we want to know your grandmother's story. We want to know your great, great grandmother's story, but 
I I feel, you know, wavering when it comes to these slave blocks and different things like that. Confer- you know what I mean? And uh these old prejudice uh the statues you know, right. statues that they have yeah. up. Like I'm all for ripping them all down. You know, this is me personally, but again, I know there's a story there that we need to understand. You know, what do you think about that? I think first and foremost, that black people need to tell their own stories. That black people need to claim their own histories. We need not be dependent on the American government to validate us and tell us who we are. We know that they're not going to. Um, as far as the statues are concerned in a real and perfect world, I have a, a, a good friend. I'm looking at um, the statue of Robert E. Lee that uh, the Black Lives Matter protesters um, came up on. <laughs> right, 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 right. And um, so it, it's an aerial picture of um, what they did with that. Mm-hmm. In a real and perfect world, let's let's round them up and put them in a museum. Let's house them someplace, put them in a museum, because I don't want us to forget that. Um, I don't. I, I'm not all for this white guilt thing. I'm not. I'm not about that. But you know what I am about? I am about generational responsibility, mm-hmm. and it's not just something that I can say. It is something that I'm doing. Right now, on a, on a daily basis, what I, what I am doing with this Charities Children Project, with the legacy of Charities Children, is part of my generational responsibility to these women who are literally looking over my shoulders. And so if your family exploited my family, mm. if your wealth is built upon the backs of the rape and the pillage of little girls, then you have. Just like I have this generational responsibility to tell this story, you have a generational responsibility as well. Right. And I'm not trying to guilt you into anything, but I'm doing my part. And my part is telling is telling a story that is all inclusive. I am uh, blessed by people who knew in real time that what they were doing was important and they kept it. They wrote it down and they preserved it. Because had they not, had they not, this story that I am telling of free Blacks, free Black pioneers, free Blacks from 1802, free Blacks within the antebellum period, if they had not saved this stuff, who would believe me? And even more than that, had they fallen into the wrong hands, had the generations before me not been community archivist and realized the importance of our family maintaining this archive so that it's not lost, so that it's not altered, so that it's not misinterpreted. Those were those were important things that that uh, were the building blocks to where I am. So it becomes my generational responsibility to do what I can within this generation. And I expect anybody else that was on the other side of that whip, I expect the same from them. What about these, uh, you know, and the unsung heroes? Like, is it your mom, you said, and your grandmother, these people? that kept this information because since we've been doing this podcast we had like um other people uh like yourself whereas their mother and grandmothers kept information in regards to deeds and land and stuff like that and they were able to you know go back and now fight for their land and different things like that you know so it's amazing that you know these people kept that information and these stories alive i am absolutely amazed at how um my family has kept this information as well and I- the only thing that I know is that each generation did the best that they could with what was available within their their lifespan and in their right. time period. It amazes me because there were two major floods in Dayton, Ohio, right. one in 1898, one in 1913. The manumission papers survived. Oh. The uh, WW1 letters and postcards and pictures, mm. all of that survived. Um, well, they held on to those treasures, man. They got out of there with them treasures, man. Yes. They, they, that's what it was. They held on to it. Yes. They valued uh, it. And, and along the way, property and things were lost, stolen, and strayed. Yes, absolutely. But um, as I say, what what must and the only thing that can endure is your family story. I, I encourage people to journal. Um, write down a, a lot of times you think that when you journal, it has to be this real long dissertation. I can't tell you how much I have been able to receive from just a couple of lines that, um, a family member may have written inside of a card. When you, when you weave that with 
what was going on at that time in history, um, understanding why they were long-winded in this letter and, and had little to say in the next. Um, these are the kinds of things that become e e evoking. So I say that, and here's what I worry about in this generation, is in that closet behind me, there are reel-to-reels, there are cassettes, there are floppy disks, there are... So my career has spanned these many years. And so the information, yes, I have tried to keep up and, and, and put it on whatever the next best thing is. But there will come a time that technology will outrun us all. So this information and pictures that are locked on our phone, how do, what are we going to do with that? How, how are we going to retrieve that? So I encourage you to print your pictures. Um, I encourage you to write something down at some point, um, pencil and paper, print out what you, uh, your thoughts and the things that you have, your Facebook post. And, and things like that. Print that stuff out because that's your story. That's how you've documented it. It may not always be available, but at some point it's got to get on paper. It's got to get to something that is not going to, um, something that will stand the test of time. There's a lot that can be gleaned from family recipes. I encourage people to write down and pass down the family recipes. In, in some of my research, there are, um, there are places in Africa, there are chefs in Africa who can tell you what region of the continent you're from, depending on how you season your greens. And um, I find that to be absolutely fascinating. So um, saving family recipes are uh, important because the information that can be gleaned from that. I'm jotting down what your elders are saying. So, yeah, a lot of times we might think, you know, you know, grandma just talking or whatever. But if you, you know, sit down and actually listen to what they're saying, yeah. that, that kind of opens up the rabbit hole for your research. You might not know, like you said, what your family members have done during that time, you know and what contributions they might've made to society at that time. And then sometimes we do know, and it's the same old stories. Here mm -hmm. she go talking about that time, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, I will say to that, um, keep living. I was that person as well. And I always knew, I always knew that I would be writing this story. I always knew that I would be doing this. And um, I wish that I had paid a little closer attention. Yeah, it's, but, um, it's funny that you should say, you know, like how you were young and all of this information was in your family. Like, and, you know, it's in my family, too. Like, and this is the thing I'm kicking myself about is that, you know, I had to do a book report one time. Right. And it was on Mary McLeod Bethune. And we happened to be relatives to Mary McLeod Bethune. My great grandmother was living at the time and she actually mm -hmm. met her. You know, we have first cousins and stuff like that. And I hated to do the big report and everything like that. But as now, you know, she's dead and gone now, you know, and I would wish I had spent more time and maybe, you know, but I was too young to even understand how important that was. You know what I mean? So I get what you're saying. You know, we should document everything. We should, you know, put all our thoughts down and everything. You never know how it might inspire your children in the future. Well, it will inspire them. That's what you need to understand is that yeah. it will inspire them. And one of the things that we are going to do, I know my publicist is going to get me for uh, saying it too soon, but we want to put together a how to uh, because we're often asked how this how how do you do this? And um, right. so we, we're, we've been um, brainstorming and, and writing literally the things that we do um, subconsciously sometimes, you know, we've been purposely writing that down and chronicling that. Um, and one of the things is taking the time to listen to our elders. They have um, wonderful stories to tell. And if you're not interested, I just say, keep asking around because you're going to find there's a niece or there's a nephew. There's a kid who who might be interested. And then the other thing is, if you're not interested, let me tell you what, record it. Just record it. And then it is something that you'll have and it's something that you can go back to and it's not lost forever. It's funny. You know, I was laughing as you were saying, you know, you're putting the, together the how to because that was I was just going to say what would be the steps of a person who wants to 
to do this. So if your publicist is going to get you, she's going to get me too. Because I was going to ask the same <laughs> question. Yeah, we, all, we all went in on yeah, this. Yeah, we were going to say, like, how do you do it? How do you go about, what's the first step that leads you to that? And I mean, we've covered so much already where you were saying, like, just listening and getting mm-hmm. the recipes and all. But, you know, so you're pretty much given the the spill on the how to <laughs> Freddie. Yeah, yeah, do that. Do that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, things like uh, family traditions of, of foods, particular foods that you have at events. Um, we always have lemonade at, at events. We have ways of everybody has their own spin on the lemonade, how uh, they infuse it or whatnot. And um, it was only recently that I discovered why we have lemonade. Uh, my great grandfather, his mother, uh, Elizabeth Higgins, used to bring the lemonade to the parties at the Dunbar house, at the Paul Dunbar house. Um, mm. Charles Higgins and Paul Dunbar were uh, boyhood friends. Um, my great grandfather, Charles Higgins, was the executive of Paul Dunbar's estate. And his so his mother, uh, they in a book that I was reading, they wrote about how uh, Mrs. Higgins was known for her delicious lemonade. And so she always bought this lemonade to um, the the Saturday fish fish fries. So I was blown away that, oh, so that's why, <laughs> you know, we have, we, we still enjoy lemonade to this day. So th- there are little things like that, that, um, that make, make note of the uh, family menus at the party, whose, whose favorites, uh, uh, the, the favorite recipes. And then as I said, you may not be interested in what your elders have to say in this moment, but hit that record. We've got that record on our phones. You can transcribe it at another time. I guarantee you that the seasons in your life change and who you are 20 years ago is not who you are today. Things that interested you then will not be the things that interest you now. And even though you're not interested or it just sounds like the same old stories, write it down. Yeah. We didn't have lemonade. We had syrup. You know, the people down south call it tea. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Syrup. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Andre and I are actually, you know, blood brothers. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. And right. um, one of the things that you were talking was thinking is like, if you're able to go back to some of these towns and things that your people came from, you know, mm-hmm. like, we would go down south often visit our grandmother and then you know there they still have like in south carolina they still have plantations and things like that you know yeah. uh, they not only have plantations they got like uh cemeteries that still say a negro cemetery on it right, they? right we have gone on several vacations to family vacations to the carolinas and my children um <laughs> My children say that their mama will find a plantation no matter where we go. Uh, I have visited those <laughs> plantations in the Carolinas. I have been to the slave cemeteries. As a matter of fact, um, I was at one plantation and um, took them to task for the appearance of the slave cemetery. Um, it was all grown up, and I'm sure that it was um, snake infested, but <laughs> we had to take a moment. Yeah. We had to take a moment with our people. Uh, they explained to me that the Boy Scouts, it was the uh, local Boy Scout chapter that generally kept up that um <laughs> particular area so it was on a volunteer basis that uh this was done and of course it was done by children and it was quite evident that nothing had been done for um, yeah for quite some time and they should have known better than that yes and shame on them because Mm -hmm. as we talk once again about generational responsibility right right what are you gonna do so i want you to uh tell us about the charity children's project the charity's children project um we that encompasses our educational initiative Mm -hmm. where we do lectures and presentations not just on our family history but on the methodology of research uh, some of the things that I talked to you about today, about um, our methods, how we research, where you began in your family. One of the things that we we talk about is is where information can be received, um, can be obtained, uh, death certificates, wedding certificate, uh, wedding um, license, things like that. Uh, so that's what goes on with the educational in- in- initiative. But we are raising money to resurrect the old castle on the hill. Uh, it was noted for its rare antiques and art objects. The old castle on the hill was the home of my grandparents, Charlest Higgins Johnson, who was a poet 
and her husband, my grandfather, Ernest Johnson, who was Dayton's first Black master plumber. Uh, their home was a gathering place for many Black re Renaissance writers, J.A. Rogers, uh, Langston Hughes, and Miss Hallie Q. Brown, who was a suffragist and uh, taught three generations of our family elocution, was a frequent visitor there as well. So the castle was burnt, was um, torn down without notice by the city of Dayton in 2008. So we are striving to resurrect the castle on the same grounds so that we can provide a place of permanence for our family archive. Um, this will give other historians an opportunity to look at these records, uh, use them as part of their research, and just become a contributor to the uh, African and the uh, African American diaspora. And we think that we can do that through the Charities Children Project and resurrecting the old castle on the hill, which leads us to the legacy of Charities Children, which yeah. is our short story podcast series. And it's a, and I wanted to, to say, we listened to it and it's excellent podcast. We totally, right. in fact, we got to applaud that podcast. <laughs> because the way that you, <laughs> the way that you put it together, it was almost like an audio book, like, my brother was asking me, like, was it an audio book? Yeah, yeah. Said, when, he, yeah. when he told me about it, I thought I was going to just, you know, listen to some information, a podcast. When I pulled it up, I was like, wow, you know, this is uh, it's deeper than deeper than deep here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, and it can't just be the presentation of information. Uh, one of the things that we talked about earlier was telling our stories without exploiting our trauma. Right. Mm. And so I cannot rattle off uh these innocuous numbers and cite these terrible atrocities and not tell the rest of the story that includes our black joy yeah that's that's why we chose to do it that way my son is our music director i was going to ask you that was he the music director yeah he did an excellent job yeah. <laughs> yes um those are his original compositions there are often times where Jared is um, composing to the narration, right? You know, on the spot. So he has brought to the project a, a freshness. And I think that also it is, it is an appeal that appeals to your demographic. Right. In, yeah, in a, in a way that um, I could not. And it also allows us to tell the story without exploiting the trauma. You have um, said that time and time again on here so far. Yeah. And I, yeah. I'm like, that's what, one thing I love about it. It's more so about what they overcame as opposed to, you know, talking about, you know, what they, you know, what issues that suffering. issue that came on them, like yeah, suffering and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. that's what I like, you know, because I don't like that. You know, like we were just this weak group of people that, you know, just were like, you know, <clears throat> put in the ground, you know, like our face sat to the floor all the time. And, you know, it seems like, you know, when I hear these stories like you're giving them, it's like these proud people that came through these tough times. you know. And they were fighters. One of the yeah. things that uh, we have recently learned about Charity, when I, I mean, I've got so many stories about her and I, so, I, I do invite you to your listeners to uh, check her out. Uh, on our podcast, but something that will be in our second season is um, we have discovered uh, an, a charity's, what we believe is another one of her children. Oh, wow. His name was James Davis. He was convicted of murder in 1846. Hmm. We believe it has something to do with the attack on Africatown. This wow. woman went to the governor in 1860, went to the governor of Ohio and told him that he had held James Davis long enough and to let him go. And he let him go. Wow. wow. So every time I think I could not be more proud or that I've learned all that there is to know about her, I come across something else. It was an article in the Columbus Dispatch uh, from 1864 that mm -hmm. talked about his release and talked about Charity Brody going to the governor and petitioning the governor for his release. Mm. 1865, y'all, was... Yeah, that's when, a different time, yeah. Different time. Yeah. Yeah. Different time. Yeah. That yeah. took a lot of guts. Yeah. This was within, this was guts, within yeah. the Civil War. Yeah. 
Yeah. This was within the Civil War. Yeah. It took a lot of guts, and um, it explains a lot. And I and I tell, which is why I, I encourage people to to just dip a little bit into your your family's past because it explains a lot about who you are. I often pray this prayer where I, where I ask the Lord, "Why did you put this fire in me?" Um, what am I supposed to do with this? How am I supposed to manage this? We talk about that program director that I was talking about at the top of the um, show about um, the sexual harassment incident. There was one particular week I was in his um, office and my show was being canceled again because of a sports event. And I was literally crying. And he says to me, you know, when I tell you stuff, I never can tell how you take it. <laughs> and I thought, mm. so he has no idea that I am sitting here crying, frustrated because of course, you know how it is last hired, first fired, the first, you know, this got to be, you know, canceled, booted off or whatever. And um, I was frustrated and he had Absolutely no idea. He had absolutely no idea. Mm -hmm. And I credit those women over my shoulders. I credit. Um, I was going to say, I like it like that. <laughs> that's, that's, that's exactly the woman that they raised me to be. Right. That's right, right, exactly right. the woman that raised, they raised me to be. So, uh, and I suppose even as you asked about my sexual harassment stories and the challenges of being a black woman in a uh, male dominated industry. Right. Um, they're, they are too numerous to count, mm -hmm. but um, I persevered. Yeah, she said. Yeah, yeah, definitely, she, definitely, definitely. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, drop the mic. Situation right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say no Persevered. more. Say no more. So did anybody uh, talk to you, Miss Patricia, about the miniseries or anything like that yet? Because this is an interesting story. You know, nobody talked to um, you about it. Oh, wait, well, hold on. Before you say anything. Okay. Is that smile on your face? The my publicist is going to kill me. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think I cracked her, folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've uh -oh. seen that smile before on this show. Yes, we have. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay, that might be the, might that be the smile. Um, we are prayerful. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing, and all I, you all know this: Black History Month comes around, and Sometimes even if you're in a predominantly black school, many times if you are the only little chocolate thing sitting in that classroom, when Black History Month comes around, it's the same cast of people. Right. It is, uh, there are stories about um, docile slaves uh, oh, and yeah. Oh, yeah. how um, it wasn't really that bad. And um, it's the interpretation of other people telling our history. Many of us sit in Black history class and we cringe at the stories that are one victimization after another. What I want to do is to show the world stories of triumph, stories of Black people at a time in our history where the odds were not in our favor. And these Black people lived free lives they lived lives that respected that freedom on many levels, respected that freedom by assisting those who were still enslaved, respecting that freedom by demanding the freedom of their kin, that we can live bold and proud lives. We didn't crawl out from under any rock. America, you don't have to act like you don't know who we are, where we came from, because you do. That's right. That's right. Because you do. And it doesn't take us that long to find out. Before I began doing this research on uh, my mother's family history, like I said, it was something I always knew that I would have to do. I wrote our my dad's side of the family history for um, our family reunion book. Mm -hmm. And it was my first hand at doing online research and ancestry research. And I found in less than 30 minutes who had owned Willis Smith in just the few days before he was emancipated. He was sold from his family just a few days before emancipation, but uh, was able to rejoin them afterward. And in less than 30 minutes, I had his owners. Wow. And what that told me is that America, you have treated me like I crawled out from under a rock. And you have known who I was all the time. It had a profound effect on me that day. 
And in writing my dad's family history, it was the entree and the prelude into the research that um, I am doing now, which I knew would be more ex- extensive. And um, in for my mother's family, and this is who Charity Broadie is my mother's line, um, the history is tra- traced through women. The uh, lineage is, is women who have kept and used their uh, maiden names. And I think that means that they claimed and maintained their identity and whether overt or subliminally, they have taught, we have taught the women in our family to do the same. I was going to ask you about critical race theory, but I think that's a useless question at this point. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I will tell you, I don't know what it, what it is, and I don't know what it is in terms of my family story, right. because I can only give you the perspective right. of these of these folks. I can't give you the perspective of uh, Miss Helen next door. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, her family story, right. um, she will have a completely different perspective, perhaps, mm-hmm, of mm-hmm. the First World War than than I do. Right. Uh, Julia Higgins served with her husband mm-hmm. during the First World First World War. She left the younger children in care of the older children, and for a time went to Camp Stewart, Virginia, and served with her husband. Now that's my story. Right, 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 right. and. You can't interject your perspective into right. that. Mm-hmm. Right. You can't consider what I'm doing critical race. Right, right, right. Because this is my truth. Right, 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 right. This is my truth. You live in yours. <laughs> I, I, I can live in mine I and I can you. document I it as well. Another one for you. <laughs> You're knocking them out the park, Mr. Uh. Christian. Scott, we, could talk, we could talk to you all day about this. this yeah, is, I mean, because we're all like students of history, but I mean, like you said, um, we're like um more like, you know, American history or, you know, you know, black African American history, that kind of thing. But I never really dove into my, my family history, you know what I mean? So that's something that you're encouraging me to do right now. Well, your family I'm, history is American history. Right. Definitely, definitely. So, I know. Yeah. Right. Understand I'm, that. I'm, understand that right off the bat. One of the things that I had to research early on was that part of Charity's story is that the reason she was um, freeborn was because of her mother's nativity. Her mother was full blood Cherokee. And so I wanted to know, well, what does that have to do with her being free? Um the research that I found, of course, is American history. In 1772, George Mason argued Robin V. Hardaway. Uh, and I encourage you to look it up. It was a case that was led by a Black woman. Robin V. Hardaway essentially said that anyone born to an ind- indigenous mother could not be enslaved. Mm. Now, prior to 1772, indigenous people were enslaved in this country. Um, And at that time, there became what they called the five civilized tribes, the Cherokee among them, who did enslave Africans. But if you were if you were African. These five civilized tribes would enslave you if you were red and black like Charity was, you would be enslaved. If you were red and red, you would be enslaved. Mm -hmm. But if you were red and white, it was a whole different ball game. (laughs) It was a whole different ball game. Yeah, Yeah, so, so the reason Charity had her freedom was because she had an indigenous mother, but her mother died and it is quite clear that her father, John Davis, brought her to Ohio to ensure her freedom. Had he stayed there with in Kentucky with a black and indigenous child, she could have been enslaved by the Cherokee. So to ensure her freedom. And I find that to be quite astute right. for a black man around the oh, 1770s yeah. mm-hmm. to to realize and understand the nuances of the laws to ensure his daughter's freedom. I was uh, speaking to my my pastor back in Ohio, um, who is a a theologian and and a scholar who has taught at uh, Oxford University. And I was telling him about 
um, how I was curious about John Davis because I wanted to know about the sensibilities of a man in the 1700s who valued the life of a black child, of a black woman, of a female child to ensure her slave, her, her freedom. Mm. And my pastor said something that knocked me off my feet because it also had confirmed some research that we had recently come across. He said that was not a man of European descent. Mm. He said that was an African. Mm. He said and he said it is Africans of that period mm -hmm. that saw the value in women. And he said that in and of itself is your proof that John Davis was John Isaac Davis was likely an African, mm, a, a wow. first generation American. Wow. Um, and then, of course, we find the Dayton Daily News article that talks about Charity's uh, death and uh, notes the fact that she was a nurse. She was known as the Negro nurse as wow. well. Um, and they describe her as being one of the country's few natives and Africans. Mm. So your research will come and your confirmations will come from many places. It could be like mine that day, a conversation with the with your learned pastor. Um, and then to find the news article that described her as African and native. Wow. It's amazing. Yeah. 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 Hey, Miss Paya, we'll talk to you all day yeah. about it. I know, yeah. and I'll I talk know. to you. <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah. you have a good team. I'm, you know, looking yes. if you wanted to shout your team out. Let, you know, let. Oh, know. may I please? I yes. have a wonderful team. Um, my oral history consultant is my oldest sister, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. I have to say that of all the things that I do, the writing and the research, none of it would matter if my sister Carolyn and my sister-in-law, Cassandra, were not on the front lines with Charity's Littlest Children, with mm -hmm. our babies, meeting every month, learning the songs, the prayers, the poems that have been in our family these many generations. They are on the front lines doing the, doing the real work to keep the story alive. My uh, wonderful producer, Tamara Calvert, has been with me since my founding of the Women's Radio Network. Um, oh, I didn't even talk didn't, about yeah, that. Yeah, I was. I didn't, I mean, we got wrapped up and everything <laughs> else. That's one of the things that I wanted to discuss. I'm not, I, yeah. We're not rushing. We're not rushing you, you off. We got the time. Two. Yeah, we got to do a part. <laughs> I got, we got to do a part I got two. some more questions. Yeah, but I, just, do I don't want to. I don't want to take up all your time. Oh, hold on for a minute. Yeah, are, are you willing to do that part two? <laughs> are you willing to do I'm, it? I am. Please contact. Right. Contact my wonderful publicist, uh, LaCris. Yes, LaCris. Uh, LaCris Jordan has, uh, been phenomenal with our publicity and marketing and, uh, really helping us as a, as a guiding force. And then our historian who brings me this wonderful information. Um, and I have to say the wonderful thing about Sherry Gowdy is that Sherry does the research, but she very seldom does any analysis. So she will bring me the research and then I am able to, without bias um, from or input from uh, anywhere else, I am able to take that research, break it down and correlate it with our oral histories and our written histories. So Sherry does a wonderful job in uh, bringing me this this uh, terrific research. We even held up the debut of the podcast by some six months because of some research that Sherry brought to us about the attacks on Africatown. The story of Dayton's Africatown is too important to get wrong. It's too important to tell um in a detached or or a half way right. it um it, it had to be honored so even though it was one of the very first episodes we had finished we went back to the drawing board and uh went into rewrites and it was about three episodes that that research gleaned uh additional information for mm -hmm. that we used so she's been an invaluable asset with that uh sherry has lacris is knocking that out of the park mm -hmm. uh tamra calvert is doing what she has always done best and that is making me look good <laughs> and um i have to say last and certainly not least is my wonderful baby 
uh, my son has done a phenomenal job with this audio engineering and the music. The concept that we are using this, uh, creating this theater of the mind is something that I developed many years ago in my women's radio network days. We'll talk about that in part yeah, two. Part two. Yeah, <laughs> but it was a concept that I developed back then. And it is not lost on me that I literally had to create a person mm -hmm. who got it and was able to execute it at the level um, that we have been able to bring. <laughs> the The podcast was made so that it would have, um, so that it would have legs, right. so that you will listen for the information, you will come back for the story, and then you will enjoy the music. Mm -hmm. um, so we've we've worked that all together so that um, our listeners will listen. Um, enjoy, be inspired to tell their own stories. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yep. All right. So we're getting ready to wrap up. Thank you. Right, before, right, we right, do, right. before we do one last thing, one last thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, going back to what you said early in the conversation about, you know, um, you know, if you profited off of the backs of our ancestors that you should pay up, right? What do you feel about when a lot of these celebrities go on like Henry Louis Gates show and find out that they people own slaves and, you know, they're famous actors and, and whatnot. Do you think that it's up to them? It's their responsibility. Now you got this information and it's public mm -hmm. to kind of kick back on this thing. Um, and let's talk about <clears throat> what that pay up means. Yeah. It doesn't always mean that you need to open your wallet to me, exactly. but what but what it does mean is that when you are in positions of power and influence where um, you can provide more equity at the table, more mm -hmm. equity in the room, then that's what I mean by the responsibility. It's your responsibility to do that. I um, have said before that even in telling our family story, there were white men that were integral and assisting Charity Brody in the uh, Underground Railroad right. and assisting the United Daughters of Zion in starting the uh, First Wesleyan Church. I could very easily leave these white men out of our story. Right. But that's not our truth. You're right. Exactly. Right. That's not our truth. But you do see and understand that this is what's happening in American history. Quite often, uh, this is what's happening in states around the country and removing books from the shelves in uh, not being able to even um, say the names of these authors. When I think about them removing uh, James Baldwin and, and Bell Hooks from uh, libraries because of their gayness and their blackness has always superseded their, uh, their gayness. And so we have to be careful not to fall into those traps because those prolific writers understood the hierarchy within America and their works are presented in a way that, um, that validates that, 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 te that validates our story and tells our story. So we should not allow them to be, uh, marginalized or, or kicked to the side. So it's incumbent upon us as I talk about my sisters and the work that they do with the young people in our family and gathering them every month for arts and crafts and poems and stories. We got to do it because America is not educating our children and they're not going to. And we should not expect them to do what they never had. Right about that. Really true. If you don't know, find out. Um, and and I will say, if you don't know, begin with the legacy of Charity's children. Let your children listen to that at bedtime. You all listen to that around the dinner table. And 
I guarantee you that it's going to spark your curiosity, not just about uh, our family, but it's going to spark your curiosity about your own family and aspects of American history that um, will allow you to do the research yourself. This is an age where, as I said before, this research, I would have never been able to accomplish that in any previous uh, era. This information is all at my fingertips because of the World Wide Web. Right. So um, we can take advantage of that a little bit past our social media. Listen, uh, this was such an informative, wonderful conversation. And, and, and Miss Pat, I want some of that upfront money, though. You know what I mean? If, uh, if some of these white folk owe my family some of that money, I want some of that upfront money. money. Situation. I'll keep it. I even take a percentage on the back end or something, but I want some of that upfront money. Yeah, all right. All right. <laughs> you know, I have always said that I don't want the money. I want exactly what you said you were going to give me. <laughs> <laughs> the acres and that mule. And we can call it, we can call it quits right there. I hear you. <laughs> And, we, and I'm good. Ms. Yeah. Patricia, I, I wanted to say this. Uh, I I really appreciate your story. It's a story of power. And we get bombarded with so many stories of just suffering and being meek that um, that stuff tends to seep into you. And I'm so glad that you were able to share that story of power. Hopefully the people hear it and they be inspired. And I thank you very much for terming it just that way for um, a, a story of power. Uh, because that is what um, that is what Black history is. That is what we uh, should claim our history to be. We're we're, we're not victims. We are um, we are survivors, and our we do have stories of power. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Go out for the win. Go out. <laughs> stories of power. Thank Great you, Miss Patricia. And before we go, can you please tell us? tell the audience because we already know where we can reach you next absolutely you can find us at charitychildren.org we have an event coming up March 25th at the Afro-American Museum and Cultural Center in Wilberforce, Ohio we have our stories that are available through our website and you can find the Legacy of Charity Children wherever you get your podcast so uh, keep listening all right, yeah, check that out, everybody. And the Only One Mic podcast is available on all major platforms that you stream your podcasts on. And you can also check out our Only One Mic podcast YouTube channel to catch up on the past and current episodes. Please don't forget to rate the show and subscribe. Also, if you'd like to get in contact with the Only One Mic podcast, you can reach us via Instagram and Twitter at the Only One Mic P1, Facebook and LinkedIn at the Only One Mic Podcast, and you can reach us via email at the Only One Mic Zero Zero at Gmail dot com, and there you can leave your comments. Mr. Patricia, we thank you once again, and thank yes, you to yes, listeners yes, for yes, your yes. time. Please speak your truth quietly and clearly, and listen to others, even the dull and the ignorant, because they too have their story to tell. So until next time, please keep in mind that we never have to run from the Ku Klux Klan, so we shouldn't have to run from a black man. Peace. <laughs>